uh, thank you. Um, and uh, so I think this is really one species that at this point we think is uh, in the category experimental uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, that needs some, uh, uh, still some work to, uh, to evaluate uh, feasibility. Um, so um, well, the triple rail is a field that uh, many people have, uh, were not very familiar with until, until recently. I think it's, uh, and that's in part related to the life history uh, of the species. It's a, it's a tropical, subtropical species found in warm water. Uh, and, uh, and they are uh, usually, as adults, they are found associated with in the wild with uh, a floating structure like sargassum beds or, or sometimes we find them near crab traps or, or anything that uh, 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 floating that they can use to, uh, to aggregate. But they are not gregarious, they are typically found as one or two at a time. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, so, which means there's, there's been no uh, really large effort to fish them commercially and also their, their occurrence was dependent on, on a, a, a movement and influx of sargassum, for example, so people did not know of them. But uh, uh, it's uh, becoming more important. Uh, there's a, a fishery, a recreational, recreational fishery that's that has developed in the US. Uh, there's uh, a little bit, probably not much commercial, uh, fishing in the U.S., but in other countries, it's, it's a species that shows up in in, uh, in commercial catches. Uh, and uh, but and the interest now that uh, once people have learned about them and, and started targeting them is on the rise. There's, and you, as you see, the regulation that was a synthesis done by the Gulf State Marine Fisheries Commission recently. All, a lot of the regulation have been established in recent years. So that's a species that people start knowing about, but. Uh, uh, not really with an established uh, fishing activity or established market. Um, so there's interest to culture that species. Uh, the flesh quality is, super, is really good. It's one of really one of the best fish out there. It looks like there's a, a lot of uh, uh, the, the fillet yield is, exp is we have not measured it, but it's, uh, it's pretty pretty high. There's a lot of fillet in, the, in that fish, uh, and uh, and also we anticipate a, anticipated a fast growth rate based on data from the wild. Um, so the species have been uh, investigated at USM. We've been in interested in that fish for a few years with pilot projects in the, in the 2000. Uh, and we uh, renewed this interest and, and in partnership with a private uh, company, the Persiform Groups. Persiform is group LSC and uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, there's also a private company, Oceanus Sea Farm, that has produced, uh, uh, been producing triple that commercially and, uh, and apparently has, uh, we believe, has much more Advances, uh, they've been working on that for, for a while, uh, uh, but they could not, uh, I could try to contact them to contribute to this presentation and uh, they, they didn't want to participate, unfortunately. So we're going to present an update of what's been done in our group uh, uh, in, in, in recent years in those pilot projects. Um, so it, uh, in trades, we try to uh, control captive spawning. Uh, and also try to uh, get to the point where we can perform control crossings uh, control mating, crossing design, so that to the long run we can work with genetics, uh, and then develop protocol to culture larvae, grow out to market size, and, uh, and to the long term maybe close the stock and, and start a breeding program. That was a long term goal with, with the partnership with Persiform. Um, so I'm going to start with captive spawning, that really is a first uh, starting point when we start an aquaculture species. Uh, so we, we started, we brought our uh, wild bull stock in and, and uh, applied a natural photo period. Uh, and temperature uh, uh, based on data from uh, Mississippi coastal waters. Um, we kind of try to use as much as we could what we knew of what happens in the wild. Uh, the, the, they have a range of tolerance like a bit, between 20 Celsius and, and obviously the summer temperature in the Gulf, like, like 20 uh, up to 30 or, or even more. Uh, and uh, from our data in, in captivity, it looks like uh, below 20 Celsius, uh, is, uh, it gets very difficult for them. So uh, it's uh, probably during winter they, they get away from uh, our coastal water from the Northern Gulf. Um, so uh, under those conditions, with a standard uh, uh, natural cycle, uh, and uh, we have not uh, reported spontaneous spawning at this date. Uh, so uh, then we went ahead and monitored uh, gametogenesis in males and females, took ovarian biopsies of females and, and look at permeation of males. 
And, uh, and when we found fish that were, we thought, ready for, uh, could be responsive to hormonal therapies, and we applied slow-released implants. We, we have a couple of trials in 2010 with overplant uh, commercial implant, and then after that, we used some of the slow-release implant from Yonizoha uh, that Yonizoha and his group pro pro provided. Um, so uh, this is a picture of a, a specimen with a, a cannulation to, to uh, uh, collect some uh, oocytes from a female, and, and, uh, and uh, this is an injection uh, uh, of hormone. Uh, so the result is uh, well, uh, following those uh, administration of those uh, LHRH implants, uh, females that are at uh, advanced stage of uh, late stage of fetalogenesis do respond. So we b within usually 40 to 48 hours post induction. Uh, we, we, uh, 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 there are some egg releases, uh, usually during the night, we think late during the night. Uh, and uh, they, although the female really relatively large batches of eggs, uh, fertility was really low. We had uh, one batch in 2010 that had uh, uh, some fertil fertil fertilized eggs. Over that, a lot of pretty large release, sometimes two million eggs, but, but no fertilization. So there's uh, one of the issues is, is uh, apparently with the male and, and uh, maybe some, uh, some issues with uh, 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 spermiation and, uh, and maybe some spawning behavior too. Um, so we also looked at uh, uh, in vitro fertilizations uh, and we have not been able to do much with that part uh, so far uh, and, uh, because we, we didn't have really females that were at the right stage to induce, and, uh, induce uh, uh, oocyte maturation. Uh, and again, because we have, in, in our hands, we have, we have not found males that were spermiating actively, so we could uh, collect sperm. So we've uh, started tackling that part of the problem in collaboration with uh, LSU for the, the male side and, and develop cryopreservation so that at least and, uh, we, we can, we can uh, have some uh, sperm on hand if to, to fertilize uh, eggs. Uh, and uh, so they work with their cryo kit, uh, a prototype device and, uh, and a relatively standard protocol with a DMSO HBSS medium and, uh, and the, some of the sperm, I think uh, we had a, a number of sperm samples with a good motility, I mean well, motility in the, uh, 5 to 10 percent post uh, and, and uh, in the range of, of what's happening with uh, other species with cryopreservation. Um, sexing uh, is a problem, sex identification, uh, and, and that kind of has hurt a little bit the the early attempt to, to set up some mating groups because uh, so we can, uh, we have when we obtain an ovarian biopsy, we can determine if we have a female, uh, see if we, uh, the males don't produce males, so then if, we, if, the, if there's no uh, ovarian biopsy, then we, we, we don't know the sex. And, uh, and then we found that in, late in the game sometimes that some mating, sex, mating groups didn't have males. Uh, so uh, in, uh, in recent, most recent years, we have worked with uh, meta indirect methods to sex uh, and uh, uh, using uh, uh, gonadal steroids. Uh, we used the uh, 11 ketotestosterone, which is uh, an androgen specific of the male, and estradiol, which is produced by both sexes, but much more by females during the maturation season. Uh, validated the assay, see that the, the serial dilution uh, curves and uh, parallels the uh, uh, the, the, the standard and, and relatively good uh, replicates for, for 11 ketotestosterone and with that we've been able combination uh, combining the, the ratio of uh, 11 uh, ketotestosterone uh, uh, and estradiol uh, and uh, we, we are able to detect some of the males uh, uh, and, and we have uh, an area here where we rely more on the 11 ketotestosterone levels uh, to decide if we have male or female. Um, so, um, so far, uh, well, there's a problem if there's a variable fraction of individuals that cannot be sexed with that method, and, uh, but whenever we could make a, a call so far, everything, we have always confirmed the sex uh, uh, identification we got with that method. Um, but it involves blood drawing and, uh, and lab procedures, so we're also working on a genetic sexing method for, for the future. Um, so it looks like the lack of spawning uh, for uh, it, there's problem also all the way along the, in, in the maturation uh, process. Uh, not many females were found with advanced stages of, of vitellogenesis. As I said, the males usually don't, there's uh, very little spermiation. Uh, they complete mature gametogenesis, but uh, they produce very little milk. Um, 
so right now we are, we are working on, on really the condition of uh, holding those stockers boundary to try to uh, uh, bring them up uh, to, uh, to spawning uh, more effectively. So that's one of the focus in, in progress. Uh, so in, as a consequence, we have not been able to look at, much at larval culture yet, but uh, there was one trial in, in 2010 where uh, we uh, stocked them in, a, in, a, uh, in, sta in a static water con conditions in a larval culture tanks and fed them uh, copepods uh, for the first few days and then added rotifers uh, uh, towards the end of the period. We, we had larvae until about 10 days post-hatch. Uh, and uh, we, uh, it looks like they were eating copepods and rotifers. And, uh, and uh, since it, we had some growth, especially some growth in, uh, in, uh, in depth during the, the period, there are a couple of pictures of the developmental stages that we've, uh, we have seen du during this run. Um, so there's still a lot uh, to do with the larval culture. Obviously, as we get start getting spawns, then, then we can really investigate this uh, um, more in more detail. Uh, we believe that this is a species that could start on rotifers and not necessarily require copepod as an initial feed. So, but I think this is something we'll, we'll, we'll evaluate. Um, for grow out, uh, the one data set we have is an old data set from a study done by Jim Franks. Uh, using wild caught uh, young juveniles uh, an uh, average size of, of 12 grams uh, that were kept in a recirculating system uh, for six and a half months. Uh, and uh, so to put those data in perspective, I put some data, unfortunately these are data from cage culture, but at least that gives us some comparison to, and that's from a synthesis of paper uh, by uh, Dan Benetis and his group, and I, I have more of those data there, uh, to try to compare. So this is our triple tail data. Uh, and uh, it is kind of between the two uh, groups of cobia uh, that were reported in that publication uh, uh, in 2010. That one is a colder temperature in the Bahamas for cobia, and this is a Puerto, Rican, um, a Puerto Rico stock at warmer temperature. So it's kind of in between, probably a little sl slower than cobia, but if we compare, like that also in cities made in that paper, uh, 150 grams per month over the study period, that puts us in the upper range of things like Baramundi, Red Drum, uh, um, Amberjack, for example. So definitely the good potential for, for uh, fast growth uh, in culture conditions is, uh, seems to be there. Uh, in terms of disease, we have not had any major issues so far. Uh, there was a report of infest, uh, infection with uh, an external flatworm uh, and that led, led to uh, most of the fish, uh, the fish died, all the fish died in a, within a week. Uh, this is usually something uh, that uh, we can control with a good prophylaxis in, our, in, our, in aquaculture facilities. Uh, that could be a problem for cage culture. Uh, and uh, we had an infosis outbreak, but that didn't, uh, all the fish recovered, that was not a big problem. And uh, we, we were always worried about amidodinium oscillatum, so that's something we, we would have to look into, but we have not, no data yet on that. Of course, we did a little bit of, of genetics, uh, and uh, right now we've just, just started uh, with the genome of the HPCs, and, uh, and we, uh, we have already a pretty good assembly uh, uh, to work with, and we we'll, uh, produce an in-cage map that can be used to, uh, for future breeding efforts, uh, and there's a population structure studies in progress that's a collaboration and funded by the Girl State Marine Fisheries Co uh, Commission. Um, so it's a data deficient species. Definitely we need to work around first the spawning, get some more reliable spawning and fertilized spawn. Sexing is, is a little bottleneck, but I think, I think both of those can be worked out in that species, and, uh, and we need more data on, on larval and, and grow out. Um, the market, um, not much to say, it's not an established market. It's, I think it's commercialized in restaurants so far, so it could probably, uh, uh, some of the reef fish uh, market, uh, market size could, could, could match the, the triple tail. I think they have similar shapes. And also a good potential for uh, to be marketed as fillet. Uh, and that needs to be, to be evaluated when, once we have data on the, on the grow out. And I would like to thank a lot of people who collaborated. <laughs> Okay, we have time for one quick question. So you mentioned that uh, used a ratio of fetal testosterone and estradiol 
Yep. Sex fetish. Yep. Uh, how? I mean, I, I'm not sure to understand how how you were able uh, to determine if it's sex with that. What's like the values you use, and can this be generalized to other species? Uh, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yes, so the question is how uh, we could use the ratio of 11 ketotestosterone and estradiol to uh, uh, determine the sex. Uh, so right now we have looked mostly at, at the distribution. Uh, obviously that's a ratio that can vary a little bit depending on the season and the act activity. Uh, so uh, we, as t we sampled during, uh, we took our, our blood samples We, we, at the time, that would be the, uh, where they would be reproductively active. Uh, I don't have the, the threshold exactly on top of my head, but uh, uh, the female should not produce any 11 ketotestosterone. So as soon as we have some 11 KT, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, that's definitely a criterion, that's probably a male, that we, and we have more as a baseline. And, uh, and with the ratio, I think we look at that distribution and, and simply make a, made a cut based on that. So I'm, I don't think I can give a, a hard value there because we don't have too much data yet. But uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.